Hi, my name's Karen O'Connor and welcome to this episode of the Menopause, Marriage and Motherhood podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Hello, how are you? There's so much I want to say and I really, I'm not sure of where to start. So I'm just going to go straight into it. I'm by nature a pretty happy person. I prefer to look on the positive. You know, I do my whole Debbie Downer stuff and I do hold my own personal pity parties every now and then. And I get sick of them pretty quickly because I'd much rather be happy than not. I've tried being miserable for a couple of years at a time. It was really, really horrible. I don't enjoy doing it. And so yesterday, or no, a couple of days ago, I put up a post on Facebook commenting about despite everything that's going on in the world how lucky I am right now we're fortunate because we live on two and a half acres of land and it's nice land it's beautifully green and we got a lot of grass which for those of you who don't live in Australia that is actually quite unusual but right here we've got a lot of grass since we had the rains from Christmas and in the new year we've got a lot of grass and I keep having to mow it one day last week one of the neighbours asked if she could add me to a group messenger chat that has got all the neighbours in, which she then did, and I was made to feel really welcome to the area and everything. And then I thought, right, I'm just going to put it out there to see if anybody would like to graze their horses on the land because we got all this grass and I feel really bad about having to mow it all the time. So I put a call out and a couple of neighbours got in touch with me immediately but one of them has horses. She has a horse who is the absolute image of my daughter's horse that we just sold because my daughter's now at university in inner city Melbourne and she can't keep a horse. And the other two ponies are actually, actually have the same names as the last two ponies that we owned, Paddy and Boo. So that's really bizarre. But the other really bizarre thing is that this lady does a photo calendar of her kids every year, like we all do. And the photograph for March was taken when they were out on a trail ride, her and her two daughters on the three horses, and it was taken outside our gates. And the month that she put it on was March 2020. So she's actually got a photograph of them outside our gates, because we live at the end of a cul-de-sac, and put it on the exact month that she ends up grazing her horses on my property. That's just so bizarre. And she's quite more than happy for my daughters to ride her horses. It's just worked out so well for everybody, for all concerned. So I now have three beautiful horses. Well, one horse and two ponies on my property. And the girls are as happy as. And the neighbours are as happy as because their horses don't need to be fed hay or anything anymore. They're eating fresh grass. But it's one of those uplifting things that happen in life sometimes. And I put a post up about this on Facebook. One of my older male relatives in the UK commented that, that and this was how the exact comment went, he said, a thousand people have died in the UK. I'm glad everything's rosy in Australia. It wasn't meant as an uplifting comment. You could hear that from the way it was said. It was meant as, um, it was meant from a space of jealousy and resentfulness and whatever else is going on. And at the same time, I really get the upset that is there for him and the anxiety and the stress and the fear and, and all that kind of thing. He's got older relatives than him. He's in his 70s. He's got a brother that he's going to have to drive to hospital for radiotherapy for cancer, but they're not sure whether that's now going to be put off because of everything that's going on in the coronavirus. I get his stress and worry. And at the same time, it doesn't work. And I've had an interesting 24 hours about this because one of the things that I find is that faced with somebody's upset, I stop talking. So when I'm faced with somebody who's really angry or afraid or scared or resentful, whatever, I shut up. I stop talking. So when this relative commented on my post about how they were all in fear and stress and anxiety and everything else, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to react. In the end, I responded and said, look, it's a choice. I read the news, I watch the telly, I'm looking at the figures all the time, I'm fully aware of what's going on, I have concerns 
for the people around me and for the people I don't know. I have concerns for everybody that's having to deal with this. Whether you're directly impacted with people being sick or not doesn't make a difference. We are all still going through this. And at the same time, I don't want to navel gaze and feel sorry for myself and just wallow in the pain and the sadness and everything else. I don't want to do that because when I do that, I stop. I stop moving. I find myself frozen and completely unable to do anything. I feel helpless and hopeless. It doesn't move anything forward for me personally to feel that way. Now, for some people, and possibly this person that I'm talking about, that fear and anxiety and stress might be an instigator to action. It's not for me. It's not for other people. For me personally, I just want to curl up in a corner and not do anything when I feel that way. So I choose I consciously choose not to feel that way and that's okay because it doesn't work for me. What I don't like is other people criticizing me for that and other people telling me that I'm wrong for doing that. I'm not wrong for doing that. If I can spread a little bit of happiness in the world, that's what I'm going to do. My Facebook page at the moment is filled with photographs of people. The current one is where you put a photograph, an old photograph of yourself from when you were young and you retake the photograph now. Or I've seen ones where it's siblings doing the same thing. They've got a family photograph when they were little and they recreate the photograph when they were older and they look fantastic. They're so much fun. I've seen an article on a family that recreated Disney rides. I've seen articles on stay-at-home mums and things. They're all fantastic and so much fun. And for me, that's what pulls me through harder times is trying to do the fun things, trying to focus on things that make me feel good and make me feel happy, not focusing on all the what-ifs. That doesn't work for me personally. The interesting thing that I found with all this was that when I got criticised for being happy and then when I responded and said, look, it's a choice, I was told that I was being really patronising. And the other thing that he said to me was, thank you for your excuses for behaving how you did. His response to me saying, look, I'd rather be happy than not and I want to feel good and I know it's all going on. He responded with, thank you for your excuses. They're not excuses. And this is exactly what I was talking about in the podcast last week, how women in particular are suppressed from saying what they want to say. We're taught to be nice. So my inability to move forward is caused by not knowing how to respond to this because in my response, in what I want to do, in not listening to somebody else's upset and somebody else's, and a man I'm talking about here in particular, in not taking on board what they say about me, in that I'm patronizing and I'm just behaving badly so I'm making excuses for it and all that stuff, I don't know how to react to it. I have to think about my response and I have to think about what I'm going to do next. It's not something that comes naturally to me or easily to me. And I've got no doubt that with a bit of practice, it will come easily to me. Right now, it doesn't. Right now, what I'm noticing is that because somebody is upset, I want to make it better. Because somebody doesn't approve of my behavior, I feel like I ought to be doing something differently and I've done something wrong. And the other thing I've noticed is that if I have an opinion that goes against what older men in my family think I should do, they call me patronizing. He's not the first older member of my family to call me patronizing. And I doubt he will be the last. But isn't it interesting that that comes up? Back in 2001, John brought home a book called Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And I can say categorically that that moment when I started reading that book, that was the moment that our lives changed completely. I'd always wondered why some people got wealthy and some didn't. In the book, Kiyosaki said that it's all in your mind. It's all in the way you think about money. It's all in what you think is possible and what isn't possible. And since then, we've done a whole heap of reading 
on that subject and a whole heap of seminars and courses and programs and webinars and everything else that you could do about changing our mindset to one that is expansive and positive and looking for the good in things even when stuff is falling apart all around you just trying to focus on what you want not focusing on all the stuff that doesn't work and coming back to what I'm talking about with regards to being happy it is a choice you can choose how you react to stuff you can choose to take on board emotions and stuff in practicality it's actually a lot more difficult than it is to just talk about it when you're faced with the stuff it's not as easy as going oh yes I know what I need to do we've got to learn I've got to learn what actions I need to take when faced with certain situations in order to keep myself on that track. I'll put up links to some of the books and programs and seminars and things that I feel have made the biggest difference in our lives. Most of them don't cost anything. Some of them are books, so not much. You can get them on your Kindle for a few dollars. Some of them are more expensive courses, but all of them, all of them make a massive difference. They've made a massive difference for us and I know they've made a massive difference for other people. So go and check them out. Even if you're already on the path to personal development and everything, it's always so cool to hear recommendations from other people and find out what's worked for other people. If you can read an entire book and just get one thing out of it that makes a difference, it's worth it. The same with a seminar. The number of seminars I've sat in where I've spent two days of the three-day seminar going, oh my God, I already know all this. Why am I here? And then something happens and it makes the entire thing worthwhile. It's all about perspective and learning. And you can hear, I can hear the same thing said at different points in my life or in different situations and they'll make the biggest difference when I've heard them 10 times before and I haven't been able to take them on board. For me, it's all about constantly learning and growing. I like to learn. I like to try and look at things from different perspectives. That's what works for me. Now, going back to what I was talking about last week about how and earlier on in this podcast about how women are suppressed really subtly in the way we talk and the way we communicate even in the way we dress don't get me started on the suppression that comes through from the way we dress and the expectations and everything else I don't even want to go there for now that's something that I really need to think through because I feel really really strongly about it one of my friends who's in the medical profession pointed out that when a uterus is removed we actually call it a hysterectomy we don't call it a removal of uterus we call it a hysterectomy and the reason for that dates back about 200 years or so when doctors believed that the cause of all these problems that they couldn't resolve for women was caused by them having too many hormones and that if they removed the uterus it would stop the hysteria as they called it so they called the removal of the uterus a hysterectomy the removal of the hysteria that's why it's got that name Going back 200 years, doctors believed that most of women's problems were actually in their minds. They were caused by parts of their body that they had no control over. And if you removed those parts of the bodies, then women would become more malleable, more like men, more normal, more predictable. Rather than try and figure out what was going on, they just removed what they believed was the cause. And we still, to this day, call it a hysterectomy it's something to think about. There's an Irish author that I really like. Her name is Marianne Keyes. Ireland, for all its beauty and for all its humour and love and kindness or anything, Ireland is dreadful in its treatment of women. I was trying to think of a word to say there and I actually couldn't come up <laughs> with one. Ireland is run by the Catholic Church. It's a Catholic country and it's run by men. And even to this day, abortion is illegal in Ireland. Regardless of the circumstances, it, it is illegal. I was told the other day about this institution in the Catholic Church that was only stopped in 1998. And they call them now the Magdalene Laundries. Basically what happened was the Catholic Church in Ireland would take in unmarried mothers and then the mothers had their babies and the mothers were then kept in institutions which pretty much did 
just laundry for the Catholic Church and for other people, and they were kept as slave labour. They weren't paid, they were fed and they were housed, and they weren't allowed to leave. There was one woman in these laundries who, as people do when they're in extremis, she kept pulling out her hair, but she'd eat it. And then she'd essentially get fur balls like a cat in her stomach and she'd vomit up this hair. So the doctors in this particular institution decided to put a metal mesh in her stomach to stop the hairs from going into her stomach and catch them so they didn't have to, she didn't have to vomit. They could stop this problem. The ends of the mesh were actually poking out through her stomach wall and she was still made to work. And that's the state that they found her in, in 1998. They closed these laundries down and they took all the women out. These women were appallingly treated. That's 20 years ago, that's all. And even today, like I say, abortion's illegal. Domestic violence is turned a blind eye to. Women can't leave their husbands for violence or anything like that. There's a lot of rules that to me in my society in Australia and the UK, I just find unbelievable. Marianne Keyes, the author, she gets into a lot of this stuff. And the book in particular that stands out for me is called This Charming Man. All her books, or most of them anyway, are written with a real sense of humour about the issues that women in Ireland have to deal with. Some of them go into drugs, some of them go into alcohol, some of them go into wife beating. This particular one, this charming man, looks at a guy who ends up in politics and he's seen as the good guy in politics, but he's actually got a string of women who he's abused mentally and physically. It's a fascinating look at Irish culture and the way women are treated because even though I'm looking at Ireland and going, that's appalling, I can see more subtle versions of that in the rest of society. I saw something on the news where some boxer in the States has, had actually uploaded a video onto YouTube talking about the punches that you need to land on your wife if she comes to you with a complaint while you're in lockdown. He said, first you do this punch and then you drop and you do that punch and that'll shut her up because she'll be out cold for a while. That was what he said on the video. All around Australia and I know in other countries, all the refugees are trying to gear up for the extra people that they'll have coming in due to domestic violence over the next few weeks, few months while we're all in lockdown. That's not acceptable. <laughs> I've got to say, I hate dwelling on this kind of stuff because it's not happy stuff and I do like being happy. And I am going to continue to post stuff that is happy and joyful and look for things in life. And at the same time, I've got to figure out how I can get all this information out into the world to make a difference and to start making changes. We've got to stop suppressing this kind of thing. I've just had a five hour operation. I've got an eight week recovery where I can't do anything and probably six to 12 months where it's gonna impact my life massively because some gynecologist decided to use a mesh on me that hadn't been tested I actually had the operation to insert the mesh a month before it was banned in the US. So my gynecologist must have known that there were issues with it and he still used it, he still thought it was a good idea. And despite having two more operations while I was still in Western Australia, he never put his hand up and said, oops, I made a mistake. And 10 years now since I first got the mesh inserted, I've just had it removed. Still, no acknowledgement from any of the gynecologists that have done this procedure to say, I'm really sorry, I shouldn't have done that. There is no acknowledgement of that. I don't like being negative. I don't like, I feel like I'm getting on a soapbox and is that just me being suppressed? Is that me trying to be a people pleaser and be nice? I don't know, it could be. I want to make a difference and I want to be happy. I want to celebrate the joy in life. The joy for me right now is I've had that mesh removed. I'm feeling so much better. I can feel my body starting to heal. I've got horses in my paddocks. My two girls are at home. We're having a great time. It is lovely to spend time with my family. I've met all of my neighbours, well, on Facebook Messenger, and then I kind of waved to them at a distance because we're in lockdown, or in self-isolation anyway. I'm striking up conversations on Zoom and Skype and FaceTime with as many people as I can so that I can talk face to face with people. I can see them, I can work out how they're feeling and I can share myself better than on a phone call. 
it'd be fantastic if we could do that, if we could all do that and if we could all reach out to people with video. It's better than phone. And I know we all, I just go weird when somebody points a camera at me. But have a go at it. See if you can make it work. It's possibly easier sitting down on the computer and doing it than on a phone. I feel less self-conscious if I'm sitting at a computer. I don't know why. It's just one of those bizarre things. I think that's all for today. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I'm glad I've got an ear and I'm glad that what I'm saying is making people think and making a difference out there. I'm, I'm grateful for that. In the meantime, stay safe, everybody, and I'll talk to you again next week. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Menopause, Marriage and Motherhood podcast. Don't forget that all the links and information that we've spoken about in this podcast is available on the podcast page of my website. Thanks so much for listening. I'm looking forward to talking to you again next time. Bye for now.